Okay, hi everybody. We are going to start a new unit today, um, and our last kind of big unit for the class is on completeness and complexity. So what does that really mean? What is this unit going to be about? Well, it's going to be about hard problems. So we started to talk about some hard graph problems last unit, and remember what that means is not like hard for us to figure out not like challenging puzzle questions or challenging exam questions but computational problems where there is no good way to always solve them uh, where we don't have any good fast algorithms to do it and this is going to be related to the question that you might have heard of um, called p versus np and you might have heard of this question it's uh, arguably the most important unsolved question in all of computer science. Some people would say like in all of mathematics. Uh, it's been understood and has a lot of important implications for how we think about software, but nobody is able to prove the answer one way um, or another to this question. So we're going to actually understand what this question means. You might have read some informal descriptions before or something, but we're really going to have a deep understanding of what P and NP mean as what's called complexity classes, and what does it mean to ask whether they're the same or not? Um, and so, and and in the, along the way, we'll understand how if you come across a new problem, what how can you practically kind of categorize that as being potentially one of these really hard problems that's intractable? There's no, you know, perfect solution to it, so we have to do whatever we can and kind of fudge the answers. Or is it uh, in this group of problems that we can come up with some fast algorithm and we should just try to do that? So that's, um, this is the, probably the most theoretical unit in this class where we're going to be relying on what you learned in your SI340 class that you took at some point in the past. But it's always grounded in the practical use of, hey, you're going to come across problems. You want to be able to understand, is this, you know, what should I even be hoping for in solving this problem? How can we relate a new problem to an old problem that we understand. And that's really what this unit is all about. So here's a, a little bit of what we'll do. We'll kind of introduce here um, what is P. Next, we'll introduce like what is NP? What does that mean? Um, it doesn't mean not P. Uh, so that's if you ever say, if I ever ask you what NP is and you say not P, then um, then I will be, I'll be throwing things at you because that's a, that's a common mistake to make. That's not what that means. We'll find out. Um, reductions are kind of how we compare problems, the technical tool that we use to do that. And then we'll look at uh, what NP completeness means and, and the big kind of questions that come up at the end. So what we're trying to do is compare problems. If you remember from the beginning of class, we set up these three levels of um, thinking about software between problem, algorithm, and program. So problem is the high level thing that we're trying to solve or understand. So like one example of a problem is like a integer mall multiplication or, or sorting. And then an algorithm is one way, one description for doing that, like merge sort. And one program that does that might be, you know, array list uh, dot sort. Right, like whatever the implementation is of something like this within a particular programming language or whatever. And what we've said is that a lot of classes that you've taken are really focused on the program side of things where there's no real mystery about what's the algorithm you're supposed to use. Even in data structures class, you're usually said, you know, here's the algorithm that you need to use. Here's how this data structure should work. And now you have to make it work, um, write that program to do it. In this class, we've been trying to focus a little bit on the higher level, like, okay, we maybe we don't care so much about the details of what programming language you're using or something, but we want to know about the algorithm. What's the technique? What's the method? And we've been trying to make those as fast as possible. In this unit, we're actually going to take another higher step up and say, how can we think about comparing problems themselves? So not even thinking about any particular algorithm for that problem, but how can we compare the problem itself? And so here's some example of the bigger problems that we've looked at in this class, you know, starting from week one with like sorted array search. Um, notice I didn't say binary search. I'm not talking about that algorithm of binary search. I'm talking about the problem of finding something in an array that's sorted. The problem of sorting an array that's not sorted. The problem of multiplying two integers. The problem of finding 
a vertex cover that's as large as possible in a graph. And the question is, how do we even compare these? Because, you know, maybe for sorting and sorted array search, you can kind of see the relationship. Um, but like, how would you compare a sorting algorithm to a vertex cover algorithm? One of them is about an array and about the ordering of those things. Vertex cover has nothing to do with ordering. Um, doesn't have anything to do with an array. It's talking about information that's stored in a matrix or adjacency list. It's a graph problem. Um, and it, you know, sorting is an, is there's just one possible answer. Vertex cover is kind of an optimization problem where you have to ask how good is your answer. So these seem just to be totally different things. And the question is, how can we say, yeah, okay, they're totally different, but I want to compare them anyway. And um, one way of thinking about this in terms of analogy is like comparing two algorithms is, uh, so I picked two cyclists that I like here. Uh, Major Taylor is a um, American cyclist around the turn of the, you know, early 20th century. He competed in these crazy events that they had like at Madison Square Garden called six day races where they'd really be racing for almost nonstop for six days. Um, it just insane uh, track cycling events that were very popular at that time and which were certainly destructive to the people who competed in them, but some amazing athletes. Uh, Marianne Voss is a living, current, um, arguably best um, uh, cyclist in the world. Uh, she's won the Olympics a couple times. She's won the World Road Racing Championship a couple times, the World Cyclocrossing. So this is her in, in uh, cyclocross race. So these are both, they lived at very different times. The reason I picked these two is because I think it's it's hard even to compare these two, right? They lived at totally different times. They're on totally different kinds of equipment. Uh, I mean, not totally different, but very different um, technology in their bicycles. Uh, you know, Major Taylor was on a track. Marianne Voss is, is outside in a cyclocross course. You know, but at least they're kind of doing the same thing. At least they're kind of on the same problem, which is how do you make this bicycle go as fast as possible or, co or cover the most amount of ground in the, in the shortest amount of time? And uh, so you could think about, at least it's conceivable how, even though it might be hard, it's conceivable how you might compare these two athletes um, and say, like, maybe there's a time that they did something similar. You can compare the you know, distance or the speed that they were able to achieve, even though it's going to be hard and, and hard to have a fair comparison. So if comparing algorithms is hard, much, much harder to compare two problems. So there we're thinking about like comparing the sport of ski jumping versus the sport of water polo. How do you, we're not talking about any particular athlete, right? So we're not talking about any, comparing any particular algorithm. We're not saying like, hey, find the best ski jumper and the best water polo player and make them do some kind of uh, feats of strength between each other. What we're saying is, how do you, what's the, you know, what's the more difficult sport? Is ski jumping a harder sport or is water polo a harder sport? That's a really weird, hard question to, to ask. Um, and I, I don't know if for sports, if there's a good way to ask, to answer that question. Um, because, you know, somebody that would be good at one of these two sports, I think would probably not be very good at the other sport. They're both really hard. They're both very competitive, but they require, you know, different skill sets and it's, and it's hard to make that comparison. But this is nonetheless what we're trying to do with algorithms. And we have some technical tools that we can make this kind of comparison, even though I don't know whether ski jumping or water polo is harder, we will be able to answer questions about like whether sorting is harder than vertex cover, for example. And the, so the thing that we're trying to measure is the difficulty of a problem. So we're trying to say, what's the um, best possible algorithm that solves that problem, even if we don't have it. So even if we don't have this algorithm, yet, you know, if no one has uh, figured out what's the best possible algorithm, um, we want to say something about what, how good could that best possible algorithm be? Um, so like saying how good could the best possible ski jumper be versus the best possible water polo player? Um, probably the, the best athlete in the world, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, like, is not playing either of those sports. Um, you know, the Whoever the modern day like uh, um, Jim Brown or or uh, 
or or uh, Bo Jackson or something is is probably doing something else with their amazing athletic talents, but maybe not. But what I'm saying is we have to imagine what if the, the best possible water polo player versus the best possible um, ski jumper, even if that person does isn't alive or you know doesn't exist. Um, and that's the kind of comparison that we're trying to make with problems. Why do we want to do this? Well, it's an in it's interesting. So people find this is almost getting in towards math land where um, people say, well, I, why do I want to know? It's because it's a question that makes sense and I just want to answer it. But there's also practical reasons. We want to know when we have an algorithm that's already as fast as possible, right? Like merge sort runs in n log n time. We also know that there's a lower bound in terms of the complexity of sorting, we know that any comparison-based sorting takes at least n log n comparisons. We proved that um, a month and a half ago. And so that's a good example of where now we know we have um, at least up to constant factors the fastest algorithm for sorting. And so that allows us to focus our energies on something else. What you saw when you were working on the last, uh, and well, in all the programming projects in this class is that you get some big, big jumps of improvement by having a faster idea for your algorithm. And then there's a lot of small improvement from using a better programming language, using the tools of that language a little bit better, making decisions about how you put things into functions or classes, etc. So you, you have to know which level you want to be working. Because if you're working really hard to like improve that extra 10% from this algorithm and somebody else has just a way better algorithm, you should have been spending your time um, you know, in, in terms of a company or something, trying to come up with that better algorithm. So that's, that's one big motivation. And the other big motivation is the second point here is that when do we want problems to be difficult is especially with like cryptography. We want to be able to say that this thing that you would have to do to break my crypto system is hard. There is no fast algorithm to solve it. Um, and that's, that's something else that's important that's motivating thinking about computational complexity. Okay, so how do we actually do it? Um, the main idea, which we'll discuss in much more detail, is right here. So if we want to compare two problems like sorting a list versus finding the minimum thing in a list, we're not going to compare that with like big O and big theta. We, we have to think about um, the whole problem itself. Um, and and the, the tool to do that is what's called a reduction. So it's using one problem to solve another problem. So you know, solving sorting using a min algorithm, what would you do is um, repeatedly find the min. So what this tells us is that sorting, the problem of sorting, is not harder than doing a min algorithm like n times. right? Because if you did the min once, then you have the first thing in the sorted list, then you do the min of what's left. And then you min of what's left and the min of what's left. So if you're able to do min n times, that's um, one way to do sorting. It's not necessarily the fastest way to do sorting, but it's one way. So we have this kind of relationship that the complexity of sorting is less than or equal to n times the complexity of min. If somebody came up with the way to find the minimum of a size n list in one millisecond, then I could sort that list in n milliseconds for sure. And we can also go the other way around. So this one's even obviouser, obviouser, more obvious, um, which is how could I solve min if I had a sorting algorithm? Well, the, the inequality is just even much simpler. Min is less than or equal to the running time of sorting, right? If I can sort it, I can just sort first and then take the first thing in the list, that's the min. So what we see is that there's kind of a relationship here. We can't say for sure, you know, what's the inherent difficulty of either one, but we can compare them and say, okay, I know that sorting can't be any uh, worse than n times the complexity of min, and min can't be any worse than the complexity of sorting. So for example, we know sorting is at least n log n. Um, so min has to be uh, at least log n time. Otherwise, we would have a violation of that lower bound for sorting. You know, so we can we can actually learn some different interesting things about other problems by these comparisons, by these reductions. Notice uh, the really important thing here is that I didn't say I use this particular algorithm for min or this particular sorting algorithm. It's always saying any sorting algorithm could be used to solve any min problem, or any min algorithm could be used to solve any sorting problem, and and that's how we make these comparisons between problems is by 
by saying when one could be used to solve another. Um, I guess back to the sports analogy, like if you could say something about, you know, maybe every, uh, actually maybe you can make a comparison like between water polo and freestyle swimming that, okay, yeah, every water polo can at least swim this quickly. And so that's some kind of a comparison between those sports. Um, you know, every, every water polo player has to swim, but not every uh, swimmer has to be able to j jump up out of the water and, and throw a ball at a goal. So anyway, that's something interesting. Um, and then the, the last part of what we're gonna be thinking about is, is tractable versus intractable. This is actually a really good news for us. So remember the Cobham Edmonds thesis, we've been kind of leading up to this, reminding us, uh, we saw that this actually came from thinking about the matching problem. But for the purposes of much of theoretical computer science and, and this unit, we're really only gonna care about polynomial time or not polynomial time. And why is this good news for us is that it, what it means is that in this unit, n cubed and n to the fourth, that's, we, we're not gonna worry about that level of detail. We're not gonna worry about n log n versus n squared. Although that's very important when we're looking at low level complexity and algorithms for problems. Um, for the purposes of this unit, we're really just gonna focus on is it polynomial time or not. And uh, for intractable problems, tractical, uh, problems where we don't have any fast algorithms, even there, there's some different categories. So you learned about the halting problem in uh, your theory class. The halting problem is the trying to f uh, write a program which can read in any other program source code and tell you whether that program's ever gonna finish. That's, if, if such a program existed, it creates like this paradox, this contradiction, because you could feed its, its own source code and you create like a, a black hole in the universe. Um, so that's an undecidable problem. It's like, it, that definitely can't be done. Uh, it's not about tractability, like not a matter of how fast you could do it. It's like that program can't exist. Um, a next level down is programs that, you know, just seem impossible to even know what the answer is. So regex equivalence, what I mean is like taking two regular expressions and telling me whether the language that's accepted by each regular expression is the same. So of course we could try some string and see if it's accepted by both or rejected by both. But when would you be satisfied? Like when would you say, yeah, I've tried enough strings that I'm convinced that these regexes are the same? Um, hard to say. Maybe there's some other string you haven't tried yet and there's no clear way that you could make that decision. Uh, and then kind of another level down is something like integer factorization where we don't have any fast algorithms for it, but it wouldn't really break anything about the universe if we did have a fast algorithm for integer factorization. And in fact, there's a lot of progress towards it that's almost having a polynomial time algorithm, but not quite there yet. Um, so that's kind of a, even among intractable problems, there's some kind of a hierarchy of even more difficult or a little bit less, but still harder than polynomial time. Um, and and the, the big question and the distinction that's gonna get used between these, and this is actually the NP definition in a nutshell, um, is can you verify the solution quickly but not necessarily solve it quickly? So what's a classic example of that is like the traveling salesman problem, right? If you tell me an tra uh, order to go through the vertices, I can check that you've gone through every vertex, that you haven't repeated any. I can add up the distances and I can see, here's how good that traveling salesman solution is. Is it valid and how good is it? But if you tell me like there's no way to solve TSP for this graph that takes fewer than, you know, the total length 18, I really have no way of, of, of checking that. So, and I certainly have no way of generating whatever the best solution is. So verifying a, a solution, like whether a solution is good enough and, and whether it's valid, verifying that quickly, but not being able to come up with it quickly, that's kind of the, the essence of the P versus NP question that we're, we're trying to get at in this whole unit. Um, okay, so I just wanted to give you a couple of um, basic uh, simplifications that we make in order to do this comparison between problems. So the first one is we have to decide what's the machine model. We've talked about this a little bit before when we talked about like comparison operations, when we're talking about lower bounds with sorting. Um, so when we're thinking about the inherent complexity, it depends on what kind of a machine you're running on. 
Um, is it your phone? Is it ARM assembly, like what you learned in your architecture class? Is it, uh, is it Intel assembly, like what's in your laptop? Is it this vague notion of primitive operations that we had for this class? Um, there are differences between these. So for example, with the Turing machine, you remember back to uh, your theory class, the big difference here is that you have a tape and you can only move in one direction. You know, you have the state machine that has a tape and it has a head that can move to the left and right. You remember all this about Turing machines. If you don't, we'll, we'll remind you of some little pieces as we go through this unit. Um, and, and the, the big thing about that that's really not realistic about how computers work nowadays is that you can only move uh, one square at a time. So when you were uh, thinking about Turing machine things in theory class, you have to figure out how to do stuff so that you can only move the head on your tape one, one position at a time. And that's not really the way real computers work. In a real computer, I can go to any index of an array um, with the same cost as going to any, in, any other index. But the reason why we don't actually have to worry about this for the purposes of this unit is that these models are all polynomial time equivalent. So what does that mean? It's like, well, think about this slow Turing machine where you have to move the tape only one step every time. What's the difference between the fastest Turing machine algorithm versus the fastest Intel assembly algorithm? Well, it's a polynomial time difference because what's the most that you could need to move the tape is like n units where, uh, for you know proportional to the total input size and the running time of your program. And moving a tape n units, that's a polynomial time operation. So it would be instantaneous on Intel and it would take n steps on a Turing machine, but that's just a polynomial time difference. And so for the purposes of thinking about, is this a hard problem or is it easy? Is it tractable or intractable? That means that whether we're thinking about a Turing machine, whether we're thinking about this programming language, that programming language, um, a supercomputer or your phone, those questions are all the same because there are only a difference of polynomial time between them. That's one example of where I was saying like polynomial time, the fact that that's our only focus actually allows us to be kind of lazy in a fun way in this unit. And so we'll, we'll be mostly still thinking about like primitive operations, the same kind of model that we've used in this class. Um, but I just wanna emphasize that the results that we're learning about intractable problems apply to any other reasonable model as well. Um, okay, so now getting down into more specifics, what do we have to say about problems? Well, we have to compare the, the input size. So input size, as we've said from the first unit, is the measure of difficulty of how do we say when a problem should, a problem instance should be more difficult than another one. Um, you know, how does the running time scale? It, with the input size is the question that we wanna know. We usually call that N. But it's really important to be careful about what does n mean, right? So this is a question that we've said many times in this class, and I've had some tricky questions about it for you, like what does n mean here? And these are some examples that we've seen before, um, like we looked at Karatsubas versus Strassen's algorithm where the n here is the matrix dimension, where here it's the array size. So really the size of the input for Strassen's is n squared, whereas the size of the input for Karatsuba is only n, and that changes how you think about the comparison between those. Um, or like factorization. This is the value versus the size of the, um, you know, this is the value of the integer you're trying to factor versus this is the size of the array you're trying to sort. So even though the square root of n is a smaller growing function than n log n, it's really different n's. And if we thought about the input size, we would see that heap sort is a much faster algorithm than integer factorization, which is super slow. Um, and so the only thing that we're gonna care about is the length in bits or bytes of the input. Because we're comparing, you know, when you're comparing a bunch of different problems for matrix arithmetic, then it makes sense to just say N is the dimension of the matrix. Yeah, the size of the matrix is N squared, but we're just gonna say N for the dimension that's good enough. But when you're comparing um, problems that are doing totally different things, have totally different kinds of inputs, the only way to think about comparing them is by uh, thinking about that bit length. And so that's what we're gonna do in this unit. And there's one more um, simplification, which is called decision problems. So I'm not gonna get into the details here because we might think about this a little bit in our puzzle problems next time. 
but this is the the last simplifications we have to make for a fair comparison between problems is that we're only going to focus on problems whose output is yes or no this is kind of similar to theory class where the output of um, running something on a uh, DFA is just accept or reject and that's what we're gonna also focus on only for this unit and what we have to think about is why this is actually not really costing us anything since we're only caring about polynomial time or not um, and so that's that's a little bit of a tease of what we'll get into next time when we'll also define the complexity class P and get into what is the difference between that and the complexity class NP Okay, so I hope you've considered as a little bit of a review in this unit, a little bit of going through of what does a problem really mean, how do we compare problems, and what are the, some of the simplifications we make to be able to, to, be able to compare problems, um, which is what we're going to be doing for the next couple of weeks.